Brilliant. Thank you, Joel. And uh, you'll, you'll see that uh, during today I'm actually recording uh, both the audio of what's going on and, and the video so that I can share this with people. Uh, because it's always a great opportunity to be able to talk to people and share what it is that I do. So having an opportunity to present and then put that out to the wider world as well. So thank you for, for giving me that opportunity. Uh, and hello and good morning, U3A. Uh, really nice to, to be here with you. This is the first chance I've had to speak to a U3A group. Uh, and I'm really looking forward to sharing some of what I do. So the idea that I have this morning is that I'm going to spend the first part of the, the morning talking and talking about uh, what we're doing up at the festival this weekend, which is to do with allergies and epigenetics. And I'll explain what all of that is shortly. And, uh, and then we'll have a tea break in the middle, as you guys regularly do. And then I'd like to uh, take a, uh, at least one, if not two, uh, willing volunteers and, uh, and do some demonstration of what I'm talking about. So not only is it there as a concept, but we can give it to you as a practical reality as well. And if I give you a, a little bit of a potted history about who I am and how I got here, uh, so, I mean, we don't need to go right back to mum and dad and, you know, <laughs> how they met and all the rest of that. But uh, exactly 20 years ago this year, I decided to go and see a kinesiologist. And uh, this had come about because I'd seen a lecture by this lady talking about hacking your body's computer finding a way of getting into this electronic nervous system that we have and finding out why certain things created weakness or debility within the system and what sort of things could create strength. And the lecture was really inspiring for me. I found it really interesting. And so I went up to the, the lady afterwards and said, well, I have allergic rhinitis. I sneeze all the time. So and at, at those days, uh, unless I was using a, a steroid-based inhaler, which, you know, for various reasons I didn't want to be, um, I would be having bouts of sneezing where I'd have 10 or more sneezes in a row. And that might happen a dozen or more times a day, every day, all year round, regardless. Uh, and to say that it was a, a miserable existence at that point is an understatement. Uh, I was so good at sneezing. I'd actually, I, I used to hate sneezing through my nose because it was so uncomfortable. I taught myself to sneeze through my mouth. So I redirected it. So we've got all these interesting adaptive behaviors that we can create. And I knew this wasn't right. So I was looking for something different. And I also at the time had psoriasis as well. So if any of you don't know, this is a skin condition where we get excessive growth of skin cells and they proliferate in such a way it looks like you've got really bad dandruff and you can end up with all these big red scaly looking patches all over your body. Uh, thankfully, I wasn't quite that bad. Uh, and I just went and said, you know, I've got these problems going on. Can you do something to help? And she just said, sit down and let's see. So she didn't offer me any reassurance. She didn't promise anything. She said, let's just find out. And that was my first introduction to kinesiology and looking at how muscle testing and uh, asking questions of the body could lead to information that improved my health. And I had sessions over about nine months following that and made such significant improvements to my health but I had no idea how the lady was managing to do what she did. She was wiggling my arm and my leg for an hour every couple of weeks, mumbling away to herself, telling me to change things, stop this, do this, think this, be this. And, uh, and I didn't know why she was doing it, but every month that I went back, I felt better. And uh, by the time I'd got through to about nine months, I was actually frustrated with not understanding how things were changing. So I put myself on a kinesiology course and realized that I actually had quite a natural aptitude for it uh, because it's a very logical process. It's a little bit like following flow diagrams. So, you know, you ask a question and then there's basically two options. And depending on which way you go, leads down to the next part of the flow chart. And you either get to a point where you have information or you have an action. And that just made complete sense to me. And, uh, and so I, I picked it up very quick and easy. And uh, I didn't particularly like the career I was in at the time. I was working with children with Down syndrome and autism and extreme behavior in a residential setting because they were too extreme to be at home. And it was you know, very tough work. 
so I thought, wow, what she's doing looks loads easier than what I do. So I carried on the training until I became a qualified professional. And since 2003, I've now been uh, practicing uh, full time as a professional kinesiologist. Uh, so we're, we're looking at a rosy 16 years now. Uh, and in there, I've got somewhere in the region of about 15,000 clinical hours of practice. So this is not something I do as a hobby. This is something that I do full time. I've taught kinesiology at national and international levels as well. So, uh, and these days I have a clinic up in Shrewsbury that I uh, run. Uh, we're a multidisciplinary clinic, Centre for Integral Health. And we have sort of 25 plus practitioners with all sorts of disciplines of complementary health. And uh, we work using an integral model. That is that we look at the world in a way that recognizes that there are multiple things that could be causing uh, distress for your system. So stress that the body can't cope with. Because we also have something called eustress, which is useful stress. You know, so this is uh, the stress that motivates you, the stress that encourages you and provides that opportunity for growth. And enough of that is good, but distress, the things which harm us, we don't want those. So our clinic recognises all of these different ways of looking at your body, your mind, your life, and how the environment might be affecting all of that, and we come up with ways of solving those problems. So that's a little potted history into me. Now, as we go along, please feel free to ask questions. I always see questions as an empowering aspect. So if there's anything that you want to challenge or question or ask about, please do. I can't always promise to have a good answer, but I will do my best to find a rational reason for why I'm doing or using what I'm doing. And we're here really to, to talk about allergies and epigenetics and the nature of allergy within the body, which is perhaps one of the most complex things I've ever really tried to study because it's a, it's a mystery that goes beyond what we have an idea of as a medical model. Now, the, the term was originally coined in 1906 by Baron Clement von Pirquet, uh, and yeah, great name. And, and it comes from the two uh, Greek words allos, which means altered or changed, uh, and ergon, which means reaction. So allergy really is altered reaction. And in the kinesiology models that I work with, we look at it as an altered energy reaction in the body. Because whether we like the term or not, all of our nervous energy, all of our muscular energy is just that. It's some form of biochemistry, some form of physics exchanging and changing depending on what the weather is. You know, and whether in a, a global sense of how our minds are, how our bodies are, how our relationships are, as well as how the environment is. So we all know it. Some days we wake up full of beans. You still wake up full of beans? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, good. So we wake up full of beans, ready to go for it, lively. Other days we don't. So the weather has changed. Something within our internal condition has changed. So there's been an alteration in energy. And there can be multiple reasons for why that is. So with kinesiology, we're looking at how we can manage those changes so that we can keep you in the most optimum health possible. Because let's face it, you all want to be here for a joyful and easy life. Yeah? yeah. Anybody not want a joyful and easy life? <laughs> Just check in, you know, because sometimes you never know. So, so we look at allergy as being this altered reaction at a tissue level. Now, by tissue, we're not just talking about the surface of your lungs or the surface of your skin or the lining of your digestive tract, the three most obvious points of allergy connection in the body. But we're talking right through into the cells and actually right into the cells. Because one of the things that's important in epigenetics and, and again, I'll kind of explain a bit more about the term a little bit later on. But one of the important things is, is that our DNA, in telling our body what to create and how to create it, has to receive its information from somewhere. So where does it get that information from? Now, back in the, the 90s, when the Human Genome Project was taking place, they had this idea that the human genome would contain somewhere around 125,000 to 150,000 base pairs of DNA coding. And they found it had about 25,000. 
So fruit flies are about 23,000, cabbages are about 21,000. So we're not that much more evolved in some ways than vegetables and flies. But what we do have is an informational system. So what the DNA chooses to express is based on the perception of the cell of what's taking place outside of it. So every cell has multiple, and in terms of multiple, I mean thousands of receptor sites. And these are like little uh, lock and key pads on the surface of a cell so that when molecule or substance A attaches to the lock, it sends a signal down into the cell and that goes right through to the cell nucleus that then has another receptor site on the nucleus membrane that then dissolves through, goes to the DNA and tells the DNA what the weather's like outside. So then the DNA will open up particular sections of itself, build particular proteins and complexes and biochemicals, neurotransmitters, hormones, all sorts of things for us. And that then heads back out of the cell and weirdly enough then goes to other cells to do exactly the same process. So we have this constant feedback mechanism that's taking place through our bodies. But things from outside of us can change that quite significantly. So a lot of molecules are very similar in their nature. So it might be that the molecule from something like a, a toxic metal or from a particular allergen will hit a cell receptor site and trigger a response. And that response might be inflammation. That response might be to raise your histamine levels. That response might trigger sneezing or a rash or a digestive upset. Now, those reactions are so sensitive that even what you think will change the chemistry of the cell. So music's a good example of this. There are some songs that we could all listen to and they would change our mood. Okay? We'd feel good, we'd want to dance. It might remind us of times where we've really enjoyed ourselves. And that's nothing more than your perception, your belief structure about that piece of information, that song. But what it does is it creates a biochemistry reaction in your body that tells the rest of the cells what's going on. Okay? So that's just your thought. We could put another piece of music on and it might elicit you know, a dark mood for you. It might be something that you don't like. It might bring anger up. It might bring all sorts of different types of emotions up. And that's your biochemistry then responding to your perception of what's outside of you. You know, and this is how our bodies function. And this is where epigenetics is so important. It's not just a, a case of genetic determinism where, we, uh, where whatever our DNA is, we don't really have a choice about it. You know, I mean, we don't have a choice about our DNA. That's mum and dad's responsibility. And interestingly enough, we know from research that some of the maps that you carry in your DNA can go back 14 generations so sometimes you're expressing patterns that have been sitting in your system for 14 generations. So that means in the deep, dark past, if you've got uh, uh, kind of forebearers who were miners and working in toxic environments, if they were involved in war and exposed to deep trauma, there's all sorts of residues of that left in the DNA and the DNA continues to change. You know, and of course, anything that they'd experienced before your conception will be mapped into that DNA, which is why some of us, you stick us all in a room and let's say we blew loads of pollen in here right now, some of us would react to that in a way that would give us maybe sneezing, others might get runny eyes, some of us might get hyperactive, others of us might get depressed, because there's all sorts of reasons why we change differently. And I'm sure you've seen it throughout your working lives that in the office or in the workplace that you are, through the winter, some people get the colds, other people don't. You know? And what's different is the territory inside of them. The bacteria or the virus might be the same, but how we perceive it and what our body chooses to do about that is then based on our genetics. You're all with me so far? Yes. Yeah, good. Glad. Just making sure that everybody's still alive. That's good there. Okay, so there's a big difference as well between allergy and low tolerance. And low tolerance we could also class as hypersensitivity. And technically, an allergy is only something that triggers an immunoglobin response in your blood. And technically, that can only happen in relation to a protein. 
So technically, there are only food allergies. There are, is nothing else. Now, that's one side of the clinical ecology model in medicine. The other side that was pioneered from the 50s up until the 90s by a researcher called Theron Randolph, he showed quite conclusively in over a thousand research papers that you needed no immunoglobin response in the blood to be able to demonstrate allergy. So he had this really interesting uh, centre in Chicago that he would take people into, strip them naked at the door, literally, take everything off them, fast them on pure distilled water for three to five days, and then he would put them into rooms and blow stuff into the rooms, but not tell them what was coming in, and then just observe them, video them, and, and see what they were doing. And he developed this scale of hyperactivity and hypoactivity. So there were some things that lowered uh, the energy of the body or created depression or created a depression in thyroid function, for instance. And there were some reactions that created irritability or rashes or sneezing or hyperactivity. So we had this big scale, but that could happen with or without the presence of a change in the blood. Now, medically, that's a really difficult thing to, to have because if you can't show uh, an objective correlate in the blood, how can it actually be an allergy? So Theron Randolph actually split the world of a clin clinical ecology right down the middle and some highlighted the fact that actually allergy could come from any source and it could create any symptom or exacerbate any symptom. And the other school of it goes, well, unless there's a reaction in the blood, it's not an allergy. But really what we're looking at is a change. So if there is a change in your system in response to a substance, then it's likely to be an allergy. But with allergy, that will happen with any amount of the substance, no matter how small. So it doesn't matter how little a reaction or how little amount of the substance you get exposed to, somewhere you will have a response. And that can take place instantly. So within a few seconds, in the case of anaphylaxis, we can see that happen really, really quickly. But it can take up to 72 hours to come through. And that's because your ability to digest or metabolize a substance and then the target site within your body that might set that off, because let's say it's a little bit of gouty pain in your foot, Okay, that could be an allergy reaction. Now, depending on how quick your transit time in your digestion is, it could take up to two to three days for that to really start to show. And that depends what else is going on in your life at the time. So sometimes you can have slightly quicker reactions, other times slightly slower. But you will always have a reaction. And as I say, that could be the exacerbation or creation of any symptom. So a headache, blurring of your vision, confusion, foggy thinking, memory loss. It could be a sudden burst of energy, a pain somewhere in the body, rash, sneezing, watery eyes. Almost anything that you can think of can be triggered by allergy. But the trick is with allergy that it's any amount of the substance. So with allergies, generally, unless you're having corrective work, you have to avoid the substances 100%, no exceptions, no excuses, because you will react to it somewhere. Now, with a low tolerance, that's slightly different. Your body knows what the substance is. It can metabolize it, but it has a limited ability to do so. So this is why sometimes that thing that you've eaten or come into contact with causes a reaction, it seems, and other times it doesn't. Because tolerance is something that's variable, depending on how we're doing. So on a normal daily basis... Our body's meridian system, which is the same system as an acupuncturist uses, goes through 12 two-hour surges. And every two hours, those surges change. Now, in British summertime, they're happening on the even hours. So 8 to 10, 10 to 12, 12 to 2, and so on. Greenwich Mean Time, which is real time, they happen on odd hours. So that means that if certain conditions in the body are stronger, you might have greater tolerance during their two-hour surge. Other parts of your system might be weaker or more limited, and you could have a drop in tolerance during those two hours. But with low tolerance, it's about exceeding your body's capacity to cope at that point. Now, we have a tolerance for everything in life. People, places, sounds, foods, music, clothes, everything. 
And all of us somewhere at some point have had a friend that an hour with them is enough. Okay. Yeah, everybody recognize that? Okay. Any longer than an hour and it's a bit like, mm, it's a bit too much. Now, on a good day, you might cope with them for two or three hours. If you're having a bad day, you don't even want to bump into them by accident. Yeah. That is your tolerance in action. Okay. There are some days when you look in the wardrobe and there's something you think, oh, I definitely want to wear that today. There are other days when you open the wardrobe and you pick it out and go, oh, I don't want that, I want this. Because our tolerance for various things changes depending on how we are. And interestingly enough, we will make choices most of the time unconsciously about things that will help and support us. So have you ever noticed when you're preparing your meals, you might have habitual things that you will do or have. And some days there's parts of those you just don't want to add on. And other days there's times you just want to pile it on because there's a subtle signal coming from you somewhere that there's a change in that that would be useful. Excuse me, can I just ask a question? Sure. The, the two-hour surges that you mentioned, mm -hmm. do you have a rationale for these being two hours? Are they exactly two hours? What correlates with those two hours? Where does the evidence for those two hours come from? Sure. That's so, yeah, <laughs> that's okay. So, uh, the basis of it comes through traditional Chinese medicine. And that's through observations that they've done over thousands of years observing pulse rates. So, and the pulse rates they ascribe into particular channels within the system. And uh, there's a beautiful book by uh, an acupuncturist called Lonnie Jarrett that talks about the philosophy that comes behind uh, a lot of Chinese medicine. The book's called Nourishing Destiny. And he talks about how each of these cycles is feeding each other. So in the same way that we see interconnection between different organs in the system, so the liver and the kidneys have relationship, pancreas and liver have relationship, lung and heart have relationship, they can see relationships through a much deeper basis. And uh, there's a brilliant book called The Spark in the Machine that actually goes and looks at a point of embryology and how cells from the earliest stages when they're connected, how those divisions then move into different parts of the system. But there's a germ that connects each part of those. And those we see actually as the paired systems within Chinese medicine. So they managed to work out something, you know, kind of two and a half, three thousand years ago <laughs> that in embryology they've only worked out in the last kind of 30 or 40 years and we don't know why they managed to do that but they did and they're very accurate with it and yes they're about exactly two hours each and again this is observing high and low cycles within the pulses about where energy is in the body so it will literally change the pulse every two hours and a good acupuncturist will be able to read those surging points so during a particular time of the day when they take your pulse they're more likely to see high activity in one particular pulse right than the others because of that yeah yeah sure okay so um so low tolerance, variances in the system. Now, what this means is that with low tolerance, we can have the substances, but we've got to watch when we have them and how much we have of them. So a little bit every now and again is fine. Too much or too often or when we're stressed or run down or ill is not a good idea for the body because it will exceed its capacity to cope with that. And therefore, we will have a reaction. It's like a circuit breaker going off. So the body will react, and outwardly, that will look the same as an allergy reaction. But inwardly, the reason for it is slightly different. So this is the variance between allergy, low tolerance, all of which could be termed as forms of hypersensitivity. Now, in kinesiology, we're really looking at how the nervous system is responding to these things. So our nervous system is an observer. It's continually looking at ourselves. Now, what we don't know, or what a lot of us don't know, is that our parasympathetic nervous system, which is the part of our nervous system that's there for restoration, repair, and is engaged when we're relaxed, 90% of the nerve endings involved in parasympathetic come from just one nerve, okay, which is the vagus nerve. And the majority of the vagus nerve endings are what are known as free nerve endings. So they're just going into the tissue around the body. Now the vagus nerve is cranial nerve 10, so it comes out from just behind the back of your ears here. And there are two branches for it running down the body. And they go through every major organ internally. And then they end 
uh, into what's known as the psoas muscle, which if ever of you had a nice piece of pork tenderloin, that long strip of muscle, that's a psoas muscle. Okay, so, and they actually attach just at the, the bottom end, the lower end of our thoracic spine, so the same as our ribs and our diaphragm, and then it continues, that muscle continues all the way down to the insides of the leg. And that in Chinese medicine is related into our kidneys and also into our fear and our anxiety, which is quite relevant because the vagus nerve within itself very much picks up within stress within the system, and this is distress because those changes within the system and it's sending messages in and out. Now one of the things about the vagus nerve is when we come out of our parasympathetic state, our relaxed state, and move into our sympathetic state, which is our fight or flight system, it switches off loads of parts of our system. Because when we're in fight or flight, from the brain's point of view, it's no different us being late for a meeting or having an appointment or doing something that we're nervous about than it is having a lion chase us or having an earthquake. Because it's a heads or tails system. We're either engaged in parasympathetic, relaxed, restore, repair, or we're engaged in sympathetic, fight or flight. Yeah. That's why when we're stressed, there only seems to be two options. Head towards the thing, get away from it. You know, and we see that quite commonly. And it's amazing how much our modern society stimulates that anxiety in us. Got to do this, got to be here, got to be more of this. There's this constant pushing for something not being okay. You only have to look at most TV advertising to understand the two rules that they throw within that, which is conflict and security. So car adverts are a good example of this. The idea is there's something about the environment that is difficult to navigate. It's stressful. But the vehicle will offer you security and safety and therefore mitigate the problem. So by the vehicle and the stress of the uh, environment is changed. Okay? So if you start watching for that, you'll see that in a lot of advertising. If you're hungry, you can have the product and it'll feed you. You'll feel better. Okay? So we see that in a lot of advertising. Now, the problem with the vagus nerve and the parasympathetic nervous system is that when we switch over into our stress system, that a lot of the systems involved in that are kind of put into standby. And the main systems are our digestion, our reproduction, and our immune systems. So when we're stressed, we just don't digest. We can't protect ourselves as well, and we're not as effective at reproducing. And this is why it's always a big thing for zoos when they get animals to breed in captivity because they know the animals are stressed. So by the time the animals get to a point where they breed, their stress levels have reduced enough that they can conceive and carry pregnancy to term. You know, and in a lot of ways, we're not that much different. That animal part of us is still active and still alive. So it's important that we try and relax, be calm, take care for ourselves. And this is one of the reasons why part of what I do is I do a lot of qigong, a lot of Chinese mindful movement. So it's a form of Tai Chi, or rather Tai Chi is a form of Qigong, but we won't go into that today. So kinesiology, manual muscle testing, is observing the body, observing the system, and looking at how the nervous system is in relation to specific factors. So a normal muscle in a regular test should be able to support the pressure that we use in a kinesiology test. And I'll demonstrate this for you later. If we enter anything into the system that's stressful, it will create an altered reaction within the muscle. So we know that the nervous system is then responding to a change that the body has perceived from the environment around it. And there are all sorts of levels that we can do that on. And we can also use that to find antidotes or counteractive measures towards anything that weakens you. Because if I can take an allergen, let's say a pollen or a toxin, and I can weaken your body with it, then I can also find something that will negate what will weaken the body so that we can bring it back to strength. We can feed the system so it's supported and strong. Nice, easy stuff, huh? You with me all so far? So it's really interesting that allergies are significantly on the increase at the moment as well. And by at the moment, I'm talking about the last 20 to 30 years. Okay, so it's not just a really recent thing. So varied by country, there are approximately 10 to 40% of uh, people in the world that have allergies at the moment. 
there's 150 million Europeans with an allergy disorder currently. 150 million. Okay? And that's expected to rise to almost 50% of the population by 2025. So looking at the trend that's been taking place, uh, that's you know, kind of significantly increasing. And at the moment, 44% of UK adults have at least one known allergy, if not more. And that number increased by over 2 million people just between 2008 and 2009. Okay. Now, that's a figure from 2010, so, you know, and that's the, the most uh, kind of up-to-date figures I could get on that. So who knows quite how bad that is now. We've got uh, somewhere between 1992 and 2012, there was a 615% increase in cases of anaphylaxis uh, admissions to hospitals. 600% increase. That's significant. And if we jump over the water a little bit, more than 50 million Americans have experienced various types of allergies each year. And allergies are the sixth leading cause of chronic illness in the US and that was a figure from last year. So if you think about all of the possibilities that could create illness, allergy is the sixth highest for chronic illness. And the annual cost of allergies in the US alone is exceeding 18 billion dollars every year and food allergies alone uh, are costing around 25 billion a year worldwide. So that's an incredible amount of stress within the body. Uh, and the avoidable indirect costs of failure to properly treat allergy in the EU is estimated to range between about 55 and 151 billion euros per year. And that was a figure based from 2016. And in the UK, allergy diseases across all ages cost the NHS an estimated 900 million pounds a year mostly through prescribed treatments in primary care, and this actually represents 10% of the GP's prescribing budget every year. And a lot of that is avoidable. A lot of that is treatable, and a lot of that is manageable if we understand ourselves. So part of the reasons why we have allergies is because we don't understand ourselves as well as we could. And that's simply because from an educational point of view, society isn't training us to know our bodies at the level that we could. And so I've spent now, uh, I mean, I've, I've been involved in, in complementary health for, uh, where are we now, 28 years. So I've been doing a lot of work on it. You'd never guess that I was in my 90s, would you? you know, I've been, <laughs> been working hard on looking after myself for a long time. And just by taking care of ourselves, we can improve our health. I am now healthier, fitter, have more energy, have greater flexibility than I did 20 years ago. And that, for me, is an upward-growing trend. And you guys are all now in your third age, and I love the, the beauty of that idea as well. There is nothing to stop you from continuing to improve. Has anybody actually given you that idea? Okay, sure. Have you just been told it's kind of your age and you can expect it and, and, and really you're on a bit of a... Yeah, yeah, sure. That's a lie, by the way. Just I'm going to put that straight out there. Uh, a colleague of mine coined a phrase 10 years ago that I've stolen ever since, and I do credit him with it all the time, but he says there are no real diseases of old age. There are only diseases of extended bad habit. Okay. So the fact that because you've done your bad habits for longer by the time you get older tends to be a correlate between age and disease. But it's not because you're old that you have the disease, it's because you've had bad habits for a long time. And if you change those habits even now, you can improve on your health from here on in. You know, we know the brain continues to make new neural connections and new neural growth right into your late 90s. So is anybody beyond their late 90s yet? Yes. Perfect. So you can still continue to improve. You just have to choose that. Um, and we can do it. It is all about awareness within the system. And there's nothing to stop you from changing those habits within your body. But what is it that's really kind of driven the changes in allergies over the last kind of 20, 30 years? No doubt there's a genetic predisposition for it. This is our epigenetics. 
We have our inheritance from our parents, our genome. But that's only a blueprint. The phenome, which is the expression of that, is based on environmental signaling. So you grow up down a pit, it's going to be different. You grow up in an industrial zone or you work in a congested inner city or you live in the country where they're spraying loads of toxic pesticides all the time, it's going to be different because the signal from the environment will tell your DNA what it has to express. So part of what we want to do is become aware of what factors might be causing stress for us and change them. And it is as simple as that. So epigenetics literally means that which is above genetics or that which indicates for genetics. So what we're looking at is why it is that the body will trigger to a particular thing. Is it a toxin? Is it some kind of food that is signaling something in the body that the body can't cope with? And when I do some demonstration a little bit later on, I'm going to show you how there are particular genetic body types and those body types have typical things that cause them problems because of the genetic foundations that they have. Now, you're all still unique. You know, one of my teachers says that the ultimate minority is the individual. So all of you are unique. Your genetics are unique. So how you respond will be unique. But there are some guiding generalizations, guiding orientations that we can use to map some of that as well. So your genetics has a big part of it. So severe viral infections can damage the immune system and create altered effects within there. Parasite infections within the body can stimulate quite a hyper immune response within the body. And that can actually pass over generation to generation. So if you've had ancestors who, especially if they've worked in farming, especially if they've worked in environments where they're around a lot of soil or a lot of animals, the chances of them having parasite infections was much higher. And so their immune systems would have worked on the basis of that. That would have created a particular genetic map that they would have passed on. So in a sense, you would end up with a trigger-happy immune system, more likely to react. And a lot of allergy is hyperactivity, it's overreaction. And certainly in the case of something like what I had, allergic rhinitis, that's my system going into overdrive. It's overreacting to everything. And now that I understand my genetic type, I know that that's also part of my typology, you know, is to be right at the edge, straight on the top of it all. And you might have noticed from my stream of monologue that I can just keep on talking and it's very easy to just keep going. You know, when, I, when I've done training, sometimes I'm doing four to six day training seminars and I can do this for days. So to squeeze this into like a couple of hours is, uh, is fun for me. Okay, so... We can also have excessive cleanliness as a reason for allergy as well. So part of the reason for that is that the immune system doesn't get an adequate opportunity to balance itself against the environment because we're constantly trying to get rid of things that we think are harmful rather than understanding what their role is in stimulating our systems. Uh, and an interesting fact is there are more... Uh, cells in your body that are from alien uh, aspects than there are cells that belong to your body. So there are more bacteria living in you than you actually have cells. So actually you're you know, a, a host basically for multiple alien species that are basically using you like a bus to get around and get to all their food. You know, what you think you are is really a collection of other things. Uh, and an easy example of that is mitochondria. These are a little organelle that live inside every cell in your body and they're what create our energy. They create something called adenosine triphosphate phosphate for us and uh, they're little tiny things but they behave just like bacteria they've got their own DNA and interestingly enough only the females can pass this DNA to us you know all of us have it but only the females can pass it on through reproduction uh, and their DNA is very specific now you can have as many as 5,000 of those per cell so if you think about how many cells you've got and realize that some of those are inhabited by over 5,000 little things that are just bobbing around all day and it just happens to be that their feces, essentially what it is, is helpful to you, that's why we use them. It's the same in our guts. We've got billions of bacteria going on in there and they take in some of the things that support our bodies. We 
eat and they eat our food for us. And then what they do is what they pass out as their own waste produce is something that's beneficial to us. And if you've ever wondered how they make B vitamins or vitamin C to be able to put into supplements, most of the time they're feeding bacteria and collecting their poo, freeze drying it, sticking it in a capsule and selling it to you in Holland and Barrett's. Okay? And you know, it sounds weird, but that's what we're doing. Um, and it is healthy. It is good for us. So our immune system doesn't always get the opportunity to be properly stimulated. An easy example of this as well is the fact that supermarkets in this modern age, they wash a lot of our fruit and veg and salad. Do you know what they wash it in? Chlorine. Yeah, sure. Chlorine is an antibacterial, right? We use it bleach, we use it in the toilets for cleaning stuff out. So you take low levels of chlorine into your system for 20, 30, 40 years, you're rinsing out and sterilizing your gut of the things it needs to keep it healthy. So if I can give you one really strong piece of advice, buy dirty fruit and veg you know, and wash it and peel it yourself. I go to the lengths that you know, I, I prefer organic. There's a good reason why organic makes a difference for us. But all of my organic stuff turns up relatively dirty. It's not particularly clean. And I only scrub it. I don't peel it because then I engage in what's known as geophagy. I eat the soil. And in that soil, there are trace amounts of bacteria. Those bacteria help to constantly stimulate my immune system and help me stay strong because I'm not trying to avoid them. So, you know, get your grandchildren, your children out in the mud, you know, get them dirty, let them play. You know, again, for, for those of you that have that older generation, this is what we did. You know, we went out and we weren't shy about stuff. You know, we got our hands in the mud, we got dirty, we played with stuff and we had significantly less vaccination done to us. And yet, for the most part, we were fairly healthy. And there are always exceptions to that. But there's no doubt that you guys as a third age generation are healthier than the generations that are coming through. You know, we are seeing more chronic illness start earlier in more people than we've ever seen in history because it's our environment that's triggering that for us. So part of what adds on to that is also modern vaccination. Now, when I was a, a lad in the 70s, I think I received about four to six vaccinations now, before six years old, you'll receive somewhere in the region of 46. So that's 10 times as many as I was having back then. Okay? Significant amount more vaccination. And a lot of that is given in big lumps really early on. And that's changing our immune system. The immune system is incorrectly primed because virtually none of the infections that we're being vaccinated against are injected into us. That's not their site of entry. And so our immune system, mainly through respiratory, but also through digestive and also through the skin, will respond to things very differently there than it will inside the blood. This is why certain types of allergy tests as well have limited use. Because when they do the scratch tests or when they do the blood tests, the RASP testing, that's looking at protein reaction on the skin or in the blood. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't often try and get my morning egg into me through my skin. So the body will respond completely differently on that basis. So they're not very useful tests. But because of that split in the world of clinical ecology, it's part of what's required. It's part of what they're looking for. So vaccination can create a, a big problem. So the continuous presence as well of the same foods is also causing problems. So these days in our supermarket, you can get your tomatoes all year round. You can get your strawberries all year round. There's no seasonal adjustment. So if you think about a, a song that when you first heard it, you know, your favourite artist got you excited. And you would listen to that song over and over and over and over again. And then after a while you went, I don't want to hear that anymore. And you stop playing it because it just got too much saturation for the body. It didn't want that. It wanted variance. And our diet is the same. But unfortunately, because our gut is mainly based on our interoceptive system, on our parasympathetic nervous system, our vagus nerve, we can't hear most of that. You know, most of our gut feeling we are well out of touch with. And so we don't know it. So we keep on sticking the same stuff in. And because the reaction isn't always instantaneous, 
we don't listen to it or it might arise as a pain or a change in our energy levels or mood so we don't see it necessarily as a relationship to our gut and therefore we just keep on sticking the same stuff in over and over again and eventually the body throws its toys out the pram because it doesn't want that thing anymore you know, so we have a reaction to it but I've been eating that all my life I hear all the time you know? I've never had a problem with it I've been eating it for years, every day. Well, now you've got a problem with it because you've been eating it for years, every day. You need variance. And, you know, even 100, 150 years ago, we had really easy seasonal variants. You know, our storage methods were poor. So in comparison to what they are now, you know, I don't know how many of you realize, but if you buy an apple from the supermarket and it's non-organic, not only will it have been sprayed approximately 14 times on the tree, but when it went into cold storage, it would have been dipped. It would have been sprayed another half a dozen times in cold storage where it may have stayed for up to 12 months before going onto your shelves. Oh, and they would have dipped it again and waxed it before they put it in the shelves. So you might be eating apples that are almost two years old when you buy them from the supermarket. Most of the milk that you get from a supermarket is two weeks old because of the pasteurization and the centralized control of it. You know, up in Longnor, they've got a beautiful raw uh, organic dairy farm there and you can get fresh raw organic dairy, you know, taking it straight from the farm, lots of live culture in it, very, very healthy for the body, creates hardly any reaction in those that are lactose sensitive. With allergy, it's different, but the sensitivity. So having the same food over and over again is really not good for us. We've also got technological changes as well. Double glazing, central heating, wall-to-wall -wall carpets, uh, and this actually increases the likelihood of molds and allergens uh, perpetuating themselves in an environment because the humidity and the moisture levels are different. You remember what really old houses were like? They had this kind of natural breeze that used to blow through them. You know, windows didn't quite fit. That was actually healthier for us, that natural breathing of buildings. You know, and the materials that we used to use allowed the buildings to breathe more. And that was healthier for us as well. Dust mites and molds thrive in these kind of environments. And if we could actually see the amount of mycotoxin in the air, the amount of uh, fungal toxin in the air, it's incredible. You know, and we're breathing that in on a regular basis. Plus as well, things like modern carpets, which a lot of us don't realize that they're backed and treated with pesticides. You know, those can outgas for well over four years. So you have a new carpet or a new piece of furniture and that new carpet and furniture smell, that's four years of chemicals that you're gonna breathe in and they're gonna go directly in and tell your cells what the environment, the weather is like outside of you. From that, we get lots of other environmental pollutants. You know, we've got more traffic on the roads than we've ever had. We're using more chemicals than we ever have. There's approximately 80,000 chemicals in common use at the moment. And we know that at least 5,000 of those are carcinogenic and legal to use. Okay. So, I mean, interesting things like DDT as a pesticide. Uh, you'll remember DDT from the kind of 60s ended up getting banned because of how much it was affecting uh, wildlife uh, and building up secondary poisoning in birds of prey and so on. What a lot of us don't realize is that the UK continued to produce almost the same amount of DDT up until about 10 years ago. It was just selling it to countries that hadn't banned it. You know, so we've actually still had these problems perpetuating and globally, you know, because we've got food coming as far away from North Africa throughout Europe. We're having things that are affecting us quite significantly. You know, and again, chemicals in the furniture, chemicals in your clothing. Uh, did you realize that if you buy yourself an easy iron uh, or an easy care shirt or pair of trousers, that's been embedded with formaldehyde? That's what, that's what they use to give it that easy finish. So that you're getting aspects of that that your body's picking up on as well. You know, so there are all sorts of chemicals in our environments. And we also as well have lifestyle tr stresses where our lives are, are much more generally stressful than they were and our ability to adapt to that is changing. You know, things are faster, busier, there's more pressure. Everything has to be now, now, now. You know? And that stimulates our adrenals to a, a degree where we go into stress, our fight or flight. And of course, what switches off when we go into fight or flight? Immune, reproduction, digestion. So our ability to cope is less. We have less time out, less time to rest, less time to relax. 
hopefully you guys are all doing better at that than I am. Um, you know, hopefully you're taking more time for yourselves and realizing that most things can wait until tomorrow. You know, nothing is so important rarely that it has to be done today. So, as I say, almost any symptom can be created or exacerbated by allergy. But what we also see is that addictions or obsessions with particular substances can also be allergy. Because remember, the body has an altered reaction. It doesn't know what the thing is. And so its ability to be able to metabolize it is wrong. So often it will crave the thing because it doesn't know what it's doing. So quite often, if, we, if there's that thing that we have to have every day, I must have my little bit of this, you know, then that's something that the body might not be doing well with. So it's always worth just taking it out for a couple of days. And if you're not sure about how that really applies to you, I gently dare you to stop any caffeine for a week. Just cold turkey. Make sure you have plenty of water and observe what happens to your brain over the next few days. A, how much you crave it, B, how irritable it makes you, and C, how many headaches you get. Okay? So that is a drug withdrawal. Okay? So that's your body. And coming out of allergy, especially when there's an addictive aspect to it, is not all that much different to coming off heroin. Okay? It's a bit of an extreme example, but the similarities are there. You will go into withdrawal and you will not feel good, and that will take place for a period of time until your body's managed to metabolize all of that substance out, which could take several weeks, and then you'll start to feel better again. Yeah, so it's always interesting how our bodies crave certain things, and sometimes that is because we need them. You know, but you know the difference. If it's craving chocolate cake, mm, don't know that it necessarily nutritionally needs that. If it's craving spinach, could be different. Now, there could be an argument for chocolate if it's made with really good quality chocolate, you know, and you've got some really nice minerals in there. If it's really dark chocolate, you get good sulfur, you get good magnesium, and you get some really useful compounds like PEA and anandamide that help boost mood. So there is an argument for chocolate. But if we're constantly having to crave for something, that means we're missing something as well. So we need to look at what is out of sync with our bodies. And this is where kinesiology comes in. So... Are we doing all right so far? I'm only going to go for another couple of minutes and then we'll stop for tea break, okay? And then I'll do some demo after. So I just want to tell you a little bit about the epigenetic body types that we work with. In... Sorry, can I? Mm, you can. Another yeah, yeah, sure. Away from the causes of... Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, you, you mentioned uh, vaccinations. Mm -hmm. What's your personal view on vaccinations? Do you approve of any vaccinations or... Uh... Depends on the circumstance and it depends on the quality of the vaccination. Um, I mean, I could probably talk for a good day just on this. And I think when you look at the evidence around vaccinations, it's sketchy at best. I think that a lot of the uh, research to show the usefulness of vaccinations is very carefully moulded. When you look at some of the laws around vaccinations and how they're allowed to be processed, they don't have to go through the same testing criteria as other medications because they can be seen as something that we needed for emergency situations within populations. And while there is a, a fair amount of reason for that argument, it's also abused in a lot of cases. I think there are a lot of ingredients in vaccinations that are questionable as to why they're there. And if you look at some of the companies that produce vaccinations and some of the things that uh, they also produce, you can see how some of the excipients that are used in the vaccinations are triggers for other diseases that they just happen to sell remedies for. So there's arguments about whether or not they're actually setting up adjustments in the DNA. We know that there's massive contamination in vaccinations. There is a lot of unknown viral and protein particles within most vaccinations. Um, so it's questionable. And when we look at uh, data that shows around uh, how hygiene and changes in our sewage management and in uh, kind of sterilization, how a lot of the diseases that we started vaccinating for in the kind of 60s were already in significant decline, not just by a little bit, but by a large amount. And when you start to look at sometimes when they do the graphs for the vaccines, they'll show the vaccine entry here and they'll show this decline in the disease but what they didn't show you is what was happening for the 20 to 30 years before the vaccine became introduced How would you relate that to polio? the polio is still present it's just that they're not allowed to call it polio anymore I realize that, but if you realize that they can have actually uh, inoculation induced 
huge project. Yes. And, and that's why the Americans no longer allow uh, oral uh, polio. They have yeah, oral sure. injection now. Yes. Because they find that oral polio is actually creating polio broken again. Yeah, sure. And, and that is part of the problem is that whenever we introduce something synthetic into the system, it creates a change that we can't fully manage because, again, you are the ultimate minority as an individual. So how your genome responds to a particular uh, injection or a particular substance uh, can be completely variant to anybody else. So I think there are cases for vaccination, but I think how we do it at the moment is, is pretty criminal. And uh, I, I don't really support that, but I do encourage people to become educated and to make a uh, choice. Now, as a, I, I travel a lot. I travel across the world. My, my family and I, we, we teach all over the world doing various things. I've got an eldest brother who's a Himalayan mountain guide. So he spends a couple of months every year out in Nepal uh, trekking into the, the kind of the peaks. I've got another brother who teaches internationally all over Asia, Europe, South America. Uh, and I travel all over the world myself. None of us have vaccinations. Okay, when we travel, we don't do it because we know that actually the... Uh, Louis Pasteur is probably one of the best people to quote on this. So on his deathbed, he actually recanted. He said, it's not the bacteria that's the problem, it's the environment it lives in. Right. So if the environment within inside your system is not suitable for a virus or bacteria, it cannot gestate. It's as simple as that. So understanding what creates a healthy internal environment is part of what pre prevents the disease from manifesting in the first place. And yes, there are always exceptions to that. And yes, there are always circumstances where we don't cope with that. But considering that my brothers and I have been traveling abroad for at least the last 30 years and traveling into you know, some quite impoverished and, and interesting areas in the world, and none of us have vaccinations and boosters for any of these things, uh, and none of us have become sick with any of those diseases. But the, the majority of people don't live like that, do they? But that's the problem with our society, is that we're not encouraging empowerment within people. We're not giving them the tools of understanding their own vehicle to be able to help it. And this is where, for me, epigenetics is such an important aspect. What is it that controls or signals genetics? But until we do that, until we educate, let's say, everybody, sure. surely we've got to vaccinate I mean, that, that's a catch-22 as well, because we've got to remember that financially, uh, vaccination is a very lucrative market. And that the people who are dictating a lot of medical policy are also those that stand to gain from that. And so it's just like our governments. You know, one of the reasons why we don't have a more democratic and a fairer and a more balanced society is because the people that are in control of making the choices are the ones that gain from the system being the way it is. So we're stuck in a catch-22. And this is why it's people like me that are coming and talking and saying, we need to change how we look at our bodies and how we look after ourselves to be able to improve it. But if we haven't virtually eradicated uh, polio, say, in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, sure. if we haven't vaccinated now, mm -hmm. it would be a tremendous problem with so many diseases, surely. Maybe. We don't know that. But that's the thing, maybe. So you, yeah, you've sure. got to cover that. We can't expect young maybe. to grow up. So we, we've had a significant drop in uh, illnesses caused by uh, diseases that we vaccinate against. Although, and again, I've just seen this recently with uh, um, somebody who hadn't had a mumps vaccination when they were younger who had mumps, and the doctors refused to diagnose it as mumps because technically mumps isn't around anymore, but it is. Mm -hmm. Just like polio is still around, but it has another name now because you're not allowed to call it polio uh, because we've eradicated polio but we haven't. You know, so there's a lot of massaging of information to make it look like change is happening. And while we may have dropped out some of these diseases that in the majority of cases are not fatal. So if we look at a lot of these illnesses, they're only fatal in certain percentages of the population, and those are fairly small. But what we have had in the same time period is a massive, unprecedented rise in cancers in heart diseases, in other chronic illnesses. So are we just swapping one for the other? You know, is one perpetuating the other? Are we missing some of the keys that we need to know about health to be able to look after it? So again, from an epigenetic point of view, it's a li little bit like when you buy a new car. Now, if I just gave you a new car and said, there you go, off your trot, and didn't give you any instruction in how to fuel it, 
how to service it, what kind of parts it might have. The likelihood of you getting that right is less. Now, cars are fairly unforgiving. You put the wrong fuel in it, it's going to grind the engine up. You put cheap or incorrect parts into it, it's just not going to work. Our bodies are much better. You can put the wrong fuel in for quite a long time, and it's such a brilliant system, it will kind of eke a life out of it. But it may be at the same time that you have skin disease. It may be at the same time that you've got arthritis or joint problems. It may be at the same time that you've got a gut inflammation or chronic headaches. You know, there could be all sorts of things that are going along with that, but it will adapt and it will cope because it's an incredible system. It's not as limited as a vehicle, but the premise is the same. You know, if we were educating children, again, you know, for me, if we were educating children about how to think and how to think critically and how to look at what information they're getting and ask questions about it, we'd have a much healthier society. But we don't. So we end up creating drones, creating people that are just going to follow the information they've been given rather than look at it in a way that will empower them and help them to care for their own vehicles. But this is one of the reasons why I'm as healthy as I am is because I've thrown off a lot of what I would be given and I've looked around and researched. I mean, as an interesting example, six years of training to become a doctor, how much of that do you think is based in nutrition? Just throw some numbers out. Three months. Three months, okay, anything else? Probably less. Probably less? None at all, six weeks? So information that came out just uh, three weeks ago shows on average doctors receive 20 hours of nutritional training. So these are people that are there to understand the mechanics of your machine and they know nothing about the parts that are being put into it. And they are being told that that is not relevant. The amount of uh, people that I've supported with bowel cancers that have been told by their oncologist their diet makes no difference. And why the cancer got there and how you treat it, it makes no difference if you change the diet. I mean, that just seems like incredulous. You know, if your tyres are wearing down unevenly and somebody tells you, well, it's got nothing to do with, the, with how the wheels are set, how you're driving it, you wouldn't believe them. Yeah? But this is some of the information that we're getting. I understand also the doctors have no training whatsoever in spotting cancer, skin cancer. Perhaps, sure. I couldn't comment on that. Yeah. Sure. I mean, I understand with GPs as well, there's an incredible amount of information. And I kind of consider myself a little bit like a complementary GP. I see so many different types of conditions and have to work with so much. But also we find with um, uh, GPs is that they have a great deal of difficulty in spotting the difference between uh, a nutritional de deficiency and a disease. Now, outwardly, they can appear like the same thing. But if you've been taught, taught to treat disease, you'll treat disease and you'll treat it with the tools that you have it will not eradicate a nutritional deficiency because only replacing that nutrition will change that for you. And if you can't recognize that those are even there, you'll never get to the root of the problem. But it's a great model if you want to make money because your client keeps on coming back. You use something to quiet the symptom down, it reoccurs. So you just go around these cycles over and over. This is why we end up with so much chronic disease you know, rather than acute stuff that we treat. Okay, so uh, I think it's probably a good time for letting you guys have a, a tea break and then we'll do some demonstration afterwards and I'll talk a little bit more about the epigenetics as we go along. Okay.